Good afternoon and welcome to Diving Deeper, week 31 of our year-long walk through the Old Testament. And we're looking at the southern kingdom and kings Jehoshaphat and Azariah and Hezekiah and Manasseh and Josiah today. So just keep up. Let's pray. This is for our country. Almighty God, who has given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech you that you may that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of your favor and glad to do your will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people the multitudes brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. And do with the spirit of wisdom those to whom in your name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and through obedience to your law we may show forth your praise among the nations of the earth. In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in you to fail, all of which we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Questions about last week, about readings, observations? Prophets kind of get a broad deal. How's that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not speaking specifically of the reading, but just in general, it seems like every time something goes wrong in Israel, a prophet comes along and says, hey, we should fix these things, and then they die some kind of a gruesome death. Yes, they get beat up or put in prison or stoned or killed or, yes, all of that. It's, uh, yes, it's a tough gig to be a prophet. Yeah, it really was. That's, that's why many of them are such short little books. <laughs> um, they die they don't, quick. yeah, they, yeah the, the life expectancy of a prophet is mm, questionable. Uh, uh, yeah, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, they're the longy guys, but yeah, they are the exceptions as opposed to those other guys. And we're going to get to those. Yeah, I, I, I never aspire to be a prophet. It is an unpopular gig. Anything else before we jump into the kings? Well, last week, Israel splits north and south. After King Solomon, the northern kingdom becomes Israel because they've got 10 tribes. They're the bigger guys. The southern kingdom becomes Judah because they have the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Benjamin is the smallest of the tribes. Judah's a little bit bigger, so they named the country Judah. Uh, the southern kingdom uh, sticks with kings from David's line. The northern kingdom has a whole succession of 19 bad kings who they'll be around a while and then somebody will kill them and then they'll become king and then somebody will kill them and they'll become king and then they might have a son, but then somebody kills him and they come back and it jumps around like that. They hide him in the closet so they no, they just, the well, that's in the Southern kingdom. Oh, okay. That's in the Southern <laughs> kingdom. Yeah, that's when the, the son, the descendants of David get hidden away like that. But the Southern kingdom has Judah, Benjamin, a bunch of the Levites, the ones that care about being priests and Levites, and then anybody else from any of the other tribes that want to worship God and be close to the temple, they migrate into, into Judah. But it's mostly Judah and Benjamin. So we're going to read about Judah in 1 Kings chapter 12, 14 through 15, chapter 22, 2 Kings 11 and 12, 14 through 16, 18 through 25, and 2 Chronicles 10 through 36. And you say, well, why is there all this skipping around? Well, in 1 and 2 Kings, it jumps back and forth between the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel. So it'll talk about a king of Judah till he dies, and then they'll talk about whatever the king of Israel was until he dies, and then it'll go back and pick up where they left off after the king of Judah. So they do that. Chronicles just kind of skips the whole northern kingdom. They don't care. Chronicles don't care about about Israel at all, except and, and when Israel and when Israelite kings are mentioned, it's just to say they're bad. They're, they're just bad. So don't worry about them. So Judah has a succession of 20 kings, eight of whom are good ones, or at least good-ish. Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, Amaziah, Azariah, Jotham, Hezekiah, and Josiah. If you do the math, that leaves 12 loser bad ones. And we're going to look at some of each of those. We're going to stop with great jumping Jehoshaphat. He gets only one chapter in 1 Kings, but he gets four chapters in Chronicles. Well, what's up with that? Well, Chronicles was written a hundred years after Kings ended. So Chronicles has the benefit of looking back in history and deciding um, Kings seems to be pretty contemporaneous. It's writing when these guys are actually king. Chronicles is looking back a century or two and goes, you know, 
this guy was important and this guy was a turkey and this guy was all right and and they didn't give him much press in in kings so we're going to fill in some blanks in chronicles and that's where we get all the good stuff about jehoshaphat the good parts of jehoshaphat is he uses his influence and his power for god he's king he's going to try to do a good job with it he's going to be a the descendant of David, and he's going to say, okay, David followed the Lord, let's follow the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 17, he walks with God, and he sends teachers throughout Judah, because remember, people don't have Bibles. They don't have the internet. They don't have it on their phones. And so people have heard some stories, but they haven't heard all the stories. So Jehoshaphat sends teachers throughout all of Judah, teaching them about the scriptures, teaching them the stories of the Old Testament, teaching them about Moses and Adam and Eve and uh, uh, Abraham and all of those guys. In 2 Chronicles 19, he appoints judges to apply the law fairly to everyone, and not only those people who can afford bribes or whose families are rich or who have influence or have friends in high places. Uh, bribes and corruption and political stuff like that is nothing new. It's been going on forever. And Jehoshaphat tries to turn that around. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to look at this one, the bad guys are invading from Moab and Ammon and Seir. Those are, these are three little countries on the other side of the Jordan River. They're where Jordan is today, the country of Jordan today. So when you hear about the Ammonites, the capital of Jordan is Ammon, so the Ammonites and Ammon are the same, they're the same folks. So the Moabites, the Ammonites, the people from Seir on the other side of the Jordan River, they've come across the river. They're ready to attack is Jerusalem. Jehoshaphat hears about it. They're 55 miles away, which today, you know, is an hour to get someplace. But back then we're talking marching your army on their feet. So they're three or four days out. Well, they go inside of Jerusalem, they bottle everything up, they close all the gates, they gather all their food and all of their water, and they're terrified. But Jehoshua pray. Jehoshaphat prays, prays hard. He says, Lord, we have no power to face this vast army. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, God. Come help us. Don't save prayer as the last resort. Don't do, you know, we've done everything we could. There's nothing to do but pray. Pray first. That's what Jehoshaphat does. And God sends a prophet who says, don't be afraid of these people. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. You will not have to fight this battle. Stand firm. See the deliverance the Lord will give you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow and God will be with you. That's a good thing to hear. So they trust God so much that instead of sending the army out first, they send the choir out first which all the army guys are like, sounds like a great idea to me. We'll send them out. Yes. And so they send the choir out singing, praise the Lord. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. We have some songs that use those words. And as the singers and the choir people begin to sing and praise, God sets ambushes against the people of Ammon and Moab and Seir who are invading. And the Ammonites and the Moabites rise up and fight against the people from Seir until they kill all of them. And then they turn on each other and kill all of each other. And after they finish all slaughtering everybody and there's nothing but dead people, when the Judeans get to the battlefield, there's nothing but dead bodies there. Imagine how creepy that would be. And as they walk onto this battlefield with nothing but dead bodies, there's so much stuff there that they go to plunder all the bodies and steal all the all the equipment and take their clothes and take all of their money and they take everything that's worth any value. It takes them three days to haul off all the plunder. That was Jehoshaphat's best day ever. Way to go, Jesse. Jehoshaphat, you the man. But he had some bad days too. Now, remember, after Israel split north and south, there was some civil war. And civil war was going on often between the south and the north. The south, southern guys are trying to say, well, you need to come back and we want you back in our country. And the northern guys are saying, no, thank you very much. And so they would fight each other and the north often won and the south won sometimes. But there was usually a war between the north and the south. And Jehoshaphat really wants to patch things up. He really wants to have peace with his northern neighbors. So much so that he starts hanging out with the northern king Ahab. 
You remember Ahab from last week? Ahab was the worst king in the north when he wasn't chasing white whales. He was busy building new kinds of idols and things like that. And so Jehoshaphat not only hangs out with Ahab, he takes one of Ahab and Jezebel's daughters and marries his son to their daughter to try to make this alliance with the north. Anyway, Jesse's, Jesse's really wants to get along, so he, he does that, and that does not turn out well. Uh, Jehoshaphat's successor is a bad guy, but we're, we're not going to get to him. Um, he, but Jehoshaphat goes, hangs out with Ahab, um, and, and, and Ahab, seeing that Jehoshaphat really wants to be his buddy, says, you know, I, I, I got this battle coming up. Why don't you and your army come with me? Jehoshaphat's like, oh, okay, okay, I'll go, I'll, we'll go with you. My army is your army, Mikasa Esukas. And so, uh, let's, sure, let's go. But first, let's ask God about this. And so Ahab brings out all of his professional renter prophets and they're all prophesying and they're saying, oh, go and be victorious. You're going to be great. You're going to win the battle. And Jehoshaphat says, well, this is all very nice, but don't you have any prophets of the Lord here? And Ahab says, yeah, I got one of those, Micaiah, but he never says anything nice about me. And Jehoshaphat says, oh, don't be hating, don't be hating. So Ahab sends a minion off to grab Micaiah, and the minion comes and finds Micaiah and says, all the other prophets are telling the king what he wants to hear and that he's going to win the battle. You better do the same thing. And Micaiah goes, I'll say what God says, and that's it. So Micaiah walks in. Ahab says, what do you say? What does the Lord say? Micaiah says, go for it. Go, go fight and be victorious. And Ahab can tell that Micaiah is just messing with him. He says, no, 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 tell me the truth. Micaiah says, okay, you're going to die. To which Ahab whines, see, he never says anything nice about me. Well, um, Micaiah goes on and said, here's, what, here's the deal. I saw God in heaven, and there he was on his throne, and all of these spirits were around him, and God asked, how can you think we can get Ahab to go into battle so he'll die? And one spirit made a suggestion, and another spirit made another suggestion. There was all of these people offering him, all these spirits offering him advice. Till one of the spirits says, I'll do it. I'll go be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets, and I will lure him into battle so he'll die. And God says, good job. Go for it. Now, wait a minute. Does God lie to people? No. Does God condone lying? No. So where does this lying spirit come from? Could it be Satan, whom Jesus calls a liar and the father of all lies in John chapter 8? And then you have to think, would God use Satan as his messenger? And if he did, would Satan agree to do God's will. Well, why not? Both God and Satan want the same thing for Ahab, for him to be dead. Now remember that Jesus said what Jesus says about Satan. He says the thief comes to rob, to kill, and to destroy. Satan wants everybody to be dead. And if God wants somebody dead, Satan's like, pick me, pick me, pick me. I'll help you out. He's only too glad to help. Satan volunteers to go kill somebody which means God is willing to use anyone who's willing to be used, and sometimes folks who aren't. And God is willing to work through anybody to accomplish his purposes. Remember Pharaoh back in the Exodus. Pharaoh who had set his mind, I'm not going to let my people go. And so God goes, okay, I'm going to use Pharaoh to show how strong I am. I'm going to use work through Pharaoh and use him as my whipping boy. Pharaoh's going to harden his own heart and harden his own heart. Well, then God says, I'll harden his heart too. Or remember the Assyrians who came, God kept telling the northern kingdom, straighten up, shape up or ship out. I'm going to send people to judge you. And they're like, ah, we don't care. And God sent the Assyrians who were bad dudes to judge the north. Well, later on, God's going to send the Babylonians to judge the southern kingdom. But that's in another story. So yeah, God works through... Godly people, 
God works through ungodly people. And at this point, he sends this, he lets this lying spirit go. And Ahab says to Micaiah, okay, throw him in jail and I'll deal with you when I come back from the battle. And Micaiah says, if you come back safely from the battle, then that's going to mean that God wasn't speaking through me. And mark my words. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Mark my words. That comes out of the Bible. Just about anything interesting in English came from either the King James Bible or William Shakespeare. A bunch of it came from the Bible. Mark my words. Well, they go to battle. Um, and Ahab says, hey, Jehoshaphat, you know, I got an idea. I think, I think I'm going to go just dressed as a normal charioteer. Why, why don't you wear your royal robes and look all kingly? You'll be a really impressive. And, and, and Jehoshaphat's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And he goes, uh, okay, okay. And as they ride into battle, the enemy had already gotten together and said, don't fight against anybody except the king of Israel. Because if we can kill him, the rest of the army will quit and go home. So don't fight against anybody except the king. So as the bad guys are coming into battle and the Israelites are coming towards them and they see these two armies and there's this one guy in a big chariot that's all gilded and gold and everything and he's wearing these royal robes and they of course figure that's our guy and all the bad guy chariots focus on him until Jehoshaphat cries out and says, God, help, help, help. And God helps him. And the bad guys realize, wait a minute, that's not the king. So they turn around and break off from chasing him. And as they're going off, one of the guys in the chariots just shoots an arrow. I shot an arrow into the air, and where it lands, I know not where, except it hit Ahab right between the armor. One little bitty place between the chinks of his armor. <laughs> Gats him. To which he cries to his driver, Oh, man, I'm hit. Get me out of here. And Ahab watches the rest of the battle from the sidelines as he bleeds out and dies. Just like Micaiah said would happen. Well, that's all we hear about Ahab and Chronicles, because remember, Chronicles, <laughs> Chronicles don't care nothing about those northern folks. Well, Jehoshaphat goes home after the battle's over, and one of the prophets from the south scolds him, says, what are you doing hanging out with Ahab? What are you doing? Here's, you like God. They don't. Stay away from those people, but just Jehoshaphat doesn't listen. Since Ahab's gone, Jehoshaphat goes into partnership with Ahab's son to build a fleet of cargo ships. And the prophet says, this is never going to work. And sure enough, the ships go out and get shipwrecked and sink, and Jehoshaphat loses all his money. Well, not everybody learned from their mistakes, and Jehoshaphat dies as a goodish king. He's goodish, goodish, goodish. He's certainly better than those guys up north. Well, a couple of... A couple of the kings later is a guy named Azariah, also called Uzziah, because we're not the only people that give people nicknames. What's our president's name? President. What's his first name? Joseph. Joseph, right. But do we call him Joseph? Of course not. We call him Joe. Why do we call him Joe? Because it's shorter. We do that. Okay. Well, Azariah and Uzziah, eh, they sound alike, they kind of go together, and Uzziah is a little bit shorter than Azariah, and that's why he gets these good, good two names. Well, as Uzziah, Azariah, sh starts out being good. He starts ruling at age 16. Imagine a 16-year-old as your king. Ah. <laughs> well, he builds up the people, he fortifies the land, he equips them for war, he, he uh, stores weapons in different cities around the nation so that they can defend themselves. He works the land, he's big on agriculture, he hires a couple of horticulturalists to make sure that they use the right chemicals on all of their plants and kill all the bugs. And then he provides for his people, so he, he's, really a, he's, he's really a good king. Until he decides, you know, being merely king is not good enough. I want to be a priest too, which I can understand why anybody wants to be a priest because they are some of the coolest, smartest, best looking people around. So he decides he wants to be a priest and he decides that he's going to do this and all the real priests beg him not to do it. You're the king, we're the priests, 
God's never had a king and a priest, the same person. We're, we're not trying to king anybody. You quit trying to priest things. But Isaiah's like, no, 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 I'm going to be a priest. He gets a thurible, an incense pot, and he's swinging, and he's got incense, and he goes right into the temple, and all the priests are like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. He's like, I'm the king. I'm going to do whatever I want to. And while he's swinging incense, leprosy pops out on his forehead. And all the priests see that, and they're like, whoa! And they all they mob him, and they pick him up, and they carry him out, because now he's unclean, and they don't want anything unclean in the temple. And Uzziah, when he says, oh, okay, you got leprosy on top of your head, he's like, okay, I'll go out with you guys. And they take him out, and the leprosy stays there and spreads, and he is a leper for the rest of his life. And if you remember from the Old Testament stuff we read about leprosy, if you have leprosy, you can't live close to anybody. You have to live outside of town. You have to, if you see anybody, you got to yell, unclean, unclean, unclean. You got to leave your hair messed up. You got to wear raggedy clothes. So anybody that sees you knows not to come anywhere close. Well, he's the king. So he's got plenty of money. He's not going to starve. He's not going to live homelessly. He's got a place to live, but nobody can come see him and he can't be the king anymore. So his son ends up, Jotham, his son ends up becoming the king in his place. Jotham is a pretty good king. His son Ahaz isn't, but his son Hezekiah is for the most part. Hezekiah, well, Hezekiah is in 2 Kings 18 through 20. He gets a lot of press. And in 2 Chronicles 9, 29 through 32, he gets three chapters in each of, each of the books. Well, in 2 Kings, Hezekiah starts out strong. He's going to take over from his dad, who was one of those idolatrous bad kings. And, and, and as you read this, you remember, one guy will tear down all the altars and tear down all the idols and destroy all of that kind of stuff. And the next king builds them all right back. And the next king tears them all down and the next king builds them right back. Well, Hezekiah's dad had built them all back and Hezekiah tears them all down. He starts destroying idols and statues and stuff, including the bronze snake that Moses had made back in Numbers chapter 21. When the people of Israel are wandering around in the desert and they're complaining about how badly God's treating them and how poorly God's keeping his promises and God sends venomous snakes among them to bite them and a bunch of them die. And then the people are like, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry, Moses, help us out. And God tells Moses to make a bronze snake and put it on a stick and if anybody gets bit by a snake and looks at the stick, they'll get well. Well, Moses makes the snake, puts it up on a stick. You might have seen a stick with a snake wrapped around it with the head coming out. You still see that in medical offices and hospitals. That's, that comes from the Bible. Well, now, hundreds of a thousand years later, this bronze snake is still around. And now, instead of looking at it when people get bitten by snakes, people are worshiping it and burning incense to it. And this thing that God gave them as a gift, as a blessing, they've now turned into an idol. That happens. That happens. Uh, remember the first two of the Big Ten Commandments. I'm the Lord your God. You say I have no other gods besides me. Don't make idols. Don't make anything to worship it. And they had done both with this snake. They were looking at it as a god, and they were worshiping it. Now, it hadn't started out that way, but that's how it ended up. And if we're not careful, the good things that God gives us in life, it's easy to turn them into idols. It's easy to start looking at the gifts that God gives us instead of the giver himself. God blesses you with a nice house, a nice job, a great family. You get really nice and comfortable. You decide, I'm going to do anything I need to do to keep this house and my job and my family. And you end up spending more time and energy taking care of the stuff and what God gave you than concentrating on your relationship with God. And, and that happens. Uh, it's easy to let the treasures and the gifts that God give us eclipse God himself. Uh, and if we focus on the gift rather than the giver, we're doing the same thing as they had done with that bronze snake. Well, because they were doing that, Hezekiah has it destroyed. In 2 Kings chapter 18, Assyria conquers Israel, deports them all because they're disobedient. You remember that part? That's what we talked about last week. In 2 Kings, later in chapter 18, the Assyrians aren't happy enough just taking the northern kingdom. So they've taken all of that. So, well, 
let's go to the southern kingdom. So they go down south, and um, Hezekiah buys them off. He strips off all the gold from the temple, gives them 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold. That's a lot of stuff, which appeases them for a while. But if you've ever dealt with bullies, they're never appeased for long. And they decide, you know, he gave us 11 tons of silver and a ton of gold. What else, what, what else he's got? And they come back. And when they come back, all the Jews run into Jerusalem inside the wall and they bottle themselves up again and they're ready for the siege. And the Assyrian commander walks up to the gate because words out, the Assyrians are really bad dudes. And if you just surrender, they'll let you live. Now, they're going to pick you up and take you and spread you out throughout their whole their empire. They're going to take you away from your home, but at least you, you live. So the commander comes to the door and Jehosh, uh, sorry, Hezekiah sends some officials out to talk to him. And, you know, okay, what are the terms? And the commander says, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you've got anybody to put on them. You don't even have that many soldiers in your whole stupid town. None of you can, the, the strongest of you couldn't beat the least of mine. And why do you think your God can save you? What other God has saved his people from me? I've beaten them all. I've beaten all the other gods. I'll beat yours too. And the Jewish guys who were talking to him say, shh, shh, don't talk to us in Hebrew. Speak to us in Aramaic. Now, Aramaic was the native language of the Assyrians, but the Assyrian commander is speaking to these guys in Hebrew, which the languages are kind of alike, kind of like Portuguese and Italian and Spanish. They're, they're kind of alike, but they're not exactly the same. And the Jewish guys say, shh, shh speak to us in Aramaic, because they didn't want the people up on the walls who are listening to all of this hear the threats. And the Assyrian guy mocks them and says, what do you think, I'm only here talking to you? You think you're the only one that's going to get bottled up in town and have to eat your own poo and drink your own urine? It's going to happen to all those folks on the wall, too. Y'all need to pay attention to this. And then he calls out to the people on the wall and he says, you know, if you just surrender, I'll take care of you. I'll take you to a land with grain and new wine and honey and, 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 and vineyards. I'm going to take you to this great place. Why don't you just surrender? And the people on the wall don't say anything because Hezekiah's told them, shut up, don't say anything, don't say anything, don't do it. Well, the officials slink back into the city from the commander. They go tell Hezekiah what the guy said. Hezekiah rips his clothes, puts on sackcloth, sends minions to the prophet Isaiah to ask him, what are we going to do? And Isaiah says, don't worry about those people. Nothing they say is going to happen. I'm going to cause them to hear a rumor about bad news, and they're just going to leave. <laughs> Don't worry about them. Well, sure enough, it happens. They hear a rumor. They leave. But as he's leaving, the commander writes a letter saying, I'll be back. And when I do, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to kill you. And I'm going to, if you don't surrender to me, and your God, you think your God did this? No, your God didn't do this at all. Don't trust in your God. I've beaten all the other gods. I'm going to beat your God, too. Well, there's a paper trail now. Hezekiah gets the letter. He reads the letter. He's like, oh, no. But you know what? They're making fun of God now. So Hezekiah takes the letter, spreads it out, takes it to the temple, spreads it out in front of God, says, look at this, Lord. Look at what they're saying about you. They're making fun of you. What are you going to do about this? And Isaiah sends words and says, don't worry about these folks. Come on, they're going to come back. I'll take care of them. Sure enough, when the Assyrians come back, an angel of God comes out and kills 185,000 of their soldiers in one night. And the guys who survive wake up the next day. That got their attention. That got their attention. And the king of Assyria takes what survivors he's got and goes back home in such shame that his sons sneak up behind him and kill him. God comes through in ways that we can never imagine. Remember, pray first. Pray first. When you're in trouble, praise first. Well, Hezekiah seems to be, you know, he's on a roll. He's doing great. Well, in 
first, second Kings chapter 20, he gets sick. He gets really sick. And Isaiah comes and tells him, put your house in order, write your will, get ready, you're going to die. And Isaiah walks out and Hezekiah turns his face to the wall and says, God, I've been good. I've done everything you wanted me to. Why am I going to die? And while Isaiah is walking out, the word of the Lord comes to him and Isaiah turns around and goes back in and says, okay, God's heard your whining. You get 15 more years. And then Isaiah takes a poultice of figs and puts it on this boil. Apparently, Hezekiah had some big open running sore or something, and he was infected, gangrene, we don't know. But Isaiah applies this poultice, which then makes him well, and he gets 15 more years. Does God heal through medicine? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Now, I hope when you get sick or you get hurt, you pray first, but go to the doctor. It's okay to do that. Go to the doctor. Now, if you remember, there was an Israelite king who refused to ask God's help. He kept sending for doctors, and he died. But pray first, then, then go to the doctor. Well, God gives him 15 more years. God heals him. The king, and, and, and as he's recovering, the king of Babylon has heard that Hezekiah was sick. Word gets out around in the ancient world. And the king of Babylon sends some diplomats to take him some get well presents. But, you know, kings do that. So these guys show up from Babylon. They give Hezekiah the get well wishes and the get well presents. And Hezekiah's like, I feel better now. Let me, let me show you around my place. And he takes him and he shows him his treasures and shows him the temple and shows him everything he's got, and shows him his army and shows him where his forts are, and shows him where his storage cities are. And the, the guys leave and go back to Babylon. And Isaiah comes to see him again and says, uh, uh, who were those guys? Oh, there were some guys from, from Babylon. What'd you show them? Everything. Isaiah says, well, someday everything you showed them is going to Babylon because of the sin of you people and how bad you've been and your grandfather Jehoshaphat and what he did with Ahab and all of this stuff, everything you showed them, the Babylonians are going to come and they're going to destroy the city and they're going to steal it all. And Hezekiah says, well, not my problem. Peace in my time. Peace in my time. That's familiar, yes. And before World War II, when Hitler was stealing big swaths of Europe, before the war actually broke out, he stole parts of the che what's now the Czech Republic. And nobody did anything. And the Prime Minister of England, Neville Chamberlain, goes and talks to Hitler and works out a deal that says, oh, I'm not going to steal anything else. Hitler says, I I'm happy now. I won't take anything back. And Neville Chamberlain comes back, and as he's getting off the airplane, he holds up the piece of paper, and he says, Peace in our time! Peace in our time! Which, which, which lasted about three more months till Germany invaded Poland. But peace in our time, that's exactly what Hezekiah said. No problem, we'll have peace in my time, and that's all that matters. Well, Hezekiah dies, and his son Manasseh succeeds him. And Manasseh is the worst king in all of Judah's history. And he comes to the throne at age 12, and he rules for 55 years, the longest of any king in Judah. And how does this relate to Hezekiah? Well, when Hezekiah was sick and God healed him, how many more years did God give Hezekiah? 15. If Manasseh is 12 when he becomes the king, if Hezekiah had gone ahead and died like Manasseh would not have been born. Um, God in his graciousness, God in his graciousness listens to us when we whine sometimes and gives us what we want, even if it's not really what's best. Or, we, we cannot say that, but we do know that Manasseh was the worst one ever. And it would be hard to imagine somebody else being worse than Manasseh. But um, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, remember when we read that? There's a time to be born and a time to die. 
let's not prolong life beyond God's plan. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, suicide and euthanasia are not, or they're out. But there's also no need for heroics. Uh, if it's time to die, it's time to die. And Hezekiah should have died, and he didn't. Um, okay, so Manasseh becomes king, and the Bible says he did more evil than all the nations who were in the land before Joshua got there. So all of those folks that Joshua came in and killed, Manasseh was even worse than they were. He um, passed his son through the fire. That's the biblical euphemism for burning up your children. Uh, outside of Jerusalem, there is a, a valley called the Valley of Ben-Hinnom. Uh, Jesus called it Gehenna. It's the garbage dump of Jerusalem. And for hundreds of years, people from Jerusalem took their garbage out there and burned it. So it was a smoky, stinky, nasty, decay-y place with maggots and dead stuff and burning stuff. And outside there in, has, in Manasseh's time, they had a, a, an idol to Moloch. Moloch was one of the other gods. Moloch was a bronze tube, about this big around, had a big mouth and big eyes. And it was big mouth was about this big around and the arms went out like this. And so what you did was you would put your baby on the hands of the idol and it would roll into the mouth and they built a big fire inside this bronze tube. So it's like a blast furnace. And as the fire is burning and loudly burning, it covered up the screams of the babies as they went into the fire. That's what it means when the Bible says they passed their children through the fire. Uh, yes, there were a number of kings that did that, both in the north and the bad ones in the south, but Manasseh did that. Why did, who do what? Why would they kill their children? Well, if you're worshiping a God and you want this God to like you and to be pleased with you and to be happy, you want to give them sacrifices. And you want a, a sacrifice is something that's precious to you. If I give my old broken stuff, no God's going to be happy with that. And so if I give my firstborn children or if I give my children, how can I'm showing this God that I'm really, really dedicated to him so that that God will like me and do stuff for me and take care of me. And our God doesn't do that. Our God doesn't ask for us to kill our children for him. Uh, kill your animals, yes, but don't, don't kill your children. Uh, God does not want us to sacrifice our children for anything, for the gods of money or possessions or mobility or convenience. You know, it's hard to be a parent. It's labor intensive to be a parent. Um, uh, that's only because at the end of that, anything's better than being pregnant. <laughs> including being woken up four or five or six times a night and changing diapers and getting thrown up on. So, yeah, there's that. That's a gift. That's a gift that keeps on giving. All right. So Manasseh passed his children through the fire. Uh, the Bible says he shed much innocent blood. Violence pollutes the land. Uh, we need to pray and repent for our own culture of death. And you say, well, well, I don't know. There's a lot, the violence that's really in our culture, the crime that's really in our culture. But what passes for entertainment in our culture? What passes for entertainment? What's the body count of the movies or the TV shows? Uh, I grew up watching The Untouchables. It was a black and white series about the prohibition and Elliot Ness and these guys that were going against Al Capone in Chicago. And, and, and in that TV show, it was an hour-long TV show, they killed 10 people every show. They, yeah, they had, yeah, Tommy Guns. And, but they killed 10 people in every show. And I, and I watched it, and, I, and, and after a while I began to notice, and I started to count. And sometimes they would kill a bunch, you know, they'd spread them out through the show. Sometimes they saved it till the end killed them all at once. Sometimes they killed five or six at the beginning, and then they, they waited till the end to kill the rest of them. But they killed 10 at a time. How many do they kill now in movies? Well, an Avengers movie, you know, when the bad guys come from outer space and wipe out whole city blocks. You know, what's the body count? We have a culture of violence, a culture of death, and a culture that kills its children shouldn't be surprised when they start to kill each other. Manasseh did that. And as far as we know from 2 Kings, Manasseh is all bad all the time. 
But in 2 Chronicles, chapter 33, gives us the rest of the story. In 2 Chronicles, the Assyrians come back. They beat the Jews. They take Manasseh prisoner with a hook in his nose and bronze shackles on his hands and feet. Now you think, why would they do that? It's to humiliate. You put a hook in somebody's nose, they're going to follow you wherever you want to go, aren't they? And it's to humiliate him. So they take him back, they put him in prison. And while he's in prison, Manasseh realizes that maybe he has chosen poorly. Perhaps all of those prophets that talked to him, perhaps they had something to say. Perhaps he should have paid a little more attention. And while he's in jail, he repents and he cries out to God and he asks God for help. And God forgives him and sets him free. And he goes home. And when he gets back, according to Second Chronicles, he destroys all the idols that he made and he cranks up worship in the temple again. Now, is Hitler in hell? Probably. Probably. But he didn't have to be. God is always willing to forgive if we are willing to repent. God is always willing to forgive, even Manasseh. Well, Manasseh dies. His son Ammon is as bad as his dad and gets assassinated after only two years. And his son Josiah becomes king at age eight. Josiah then becomes the best. So we've gone from Hezekiah, who was pretty good, pretty good, to Manasseh, who was the worst, to Ammon, who was pretty bad, uh, to Josiah, who becomes the best. Well, he starts out at age eight. Uh, he decides at age 16 he's going to start following God because from age 8 to 16, he's got, you know, the low-level functionaries around him who are really running the country. He's, he's king, but he's not really running the country yet. But age 16, he decides to step up, and he's going to follow the Lord. At age 22, he purges all the idols and the evil from the land that his dad and his grandfather had done, including male prostitutes in the temple. Now, in the temple in the temple. Now, we thought, you know, why is God so picky about all of these idols? Well, all of these other gods were based on fertility. And the way that you worship those gods was guys would have sex with temple prostitutes, male and female. They would pay money to the priests who got rich off of all of this. And the idea is we're showing God up in heaven what we want him to do to us. We want him to, to rain down fertility. We want our crops to work. We want our, our children. We want to have lots of children. We want our, our animals to reproduce. And so we're going to have sex in front of God because then that'll make God go, oh, oh okay, uh, I'll help you out down there. And God knew when Joshua came into the country, that's the kind of religion that they had. If you don't get rid of all of that, they're going to pull you astray. Because, okay, guys, if I give you the choice of, going to the temple and sacrificing one of your animals, one of your nice animals to worship God, or going to the temple and having sex with a prostitute, which one are you going to pick? And sadly, guys being guys often will go, oh, that, that sounds pretty good to me. Okay. I mean, we even offer you free bread and wine here. But, you know, if, if, the, if, if the church down, the church of Baal down the street was offering sex, we might have a tough time getting folks here. Well, that's, that's what was going on. And they were female and male prostitutes in the temple that Josiah's dad had let live there. Well, Josiah gets rid of them. Okay, gets rid of them. Uh, he gets rid of the mediums and the spiritists. That's the people who are talking to the dead. He went to Casa Dagan, cleaned house. Uh, stay away from the occult. And at age 26, so he's been king now for can't do the math, a long time, almost 20 years, he begins to repair the temple. The temple has been falling in disrepair for the last 20, 30 years. And so he decides, okay, we're going to start fixing things up. And during the repairing of the temple, they got to take out all of this old stuff and clean out all the debris. And as they're cleaning stuff out, they find a scroll of the law, probably Deuteronomy. 
And the guys find it, and they go, oh, and the priests read it to each other, and they're like, oh, we need to take this to the king. And they take it to the king, and they read the scroll to the king, who realizes how far Judah has fallen away from God, and he asks for God's help. And they send for a prophetess named Huldah. Huldah, can a woman be a prophet? Yeah, yeah. Now, there are two female prophets in the Old Testament. Huldah is one. Noadiah is the other. Anybody remember Noadiah? You haven't read about her yet. She shows up in Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, she's a rent a prophet who works for the bad guys. She's a false prophet. But Huldah's a good prophet, okay? Huldah really listens to God. So Deborah, Deborah in the Old Testament was one of the judges. She was one of the judges. Okay, like Samson and like Jephthah right, and like, right. like those guys. It's okay. So, so Huldah tells Josiah, because you humbled yourself, God will put off judgment and you will die in peace. Oh, that's a great prophecy, isn't it? Okay, so all of those judgment, all of the stuff that the prophets have been telling us was going to happen to us, all the bad guys are going to come beat us up. Josiah, Huldah says, it's not going to happen to you. You're going to die in peace. Now, that sounds like a great prophecy, except Josiah takes it a little too seriously, as we're going to find out here in a minute. Well, in 2 Chronicles 7.14, God speaks to Solomon and says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their ways, I will hear them and I will heal their land. That if God's people, that would be us, Repent and pray, God will heal our land. Uh, and God did that in Judah. God offered to do it in Israel. God offers to do it with us. Anytime that we think that the country might be veering off or going in the wrong direction, that's the time for God's people to start praying. To start praying. That's why I prayed for our country at the beginning. To pray. Because it's not on the government to make things right. It's on God to make things right. It's not on the government officials because they don't know any better. It's on God's people. That would be us. We know better. We've heard this stuff. And the fate of our nation is more up to us than whoever's in the government. So let's pray for our nation, our government, a lot. You'll notice in our liturgy, we pray for mayors and all in city and county government. We pray for the governor and all in state government. Today we prayed for Joe and Kamala, our president and vice president, and all who are in national government. Next Sunday we're going to pray for the members of the Supreme Court and all appointed officials. And any, Sunday, any month that there's five Sundays, we pray for the, uh, the delegates to the United Nations and all diplomats. And we pray for governing officials and we pray for those in authority because the way they go, they take us with them. And Josiah, the promise that he got from Huldah was, because you've humbled yourself, because you've repeat, repented, all of that nasty stuff that all of those prophets have been saying is not going to happen to you now. Well, Josiah says, this is great. I'm going to die in peace. Love it when that happens. Well, Josiah reinstitutes the Passover. Now, we think a Passover happens every year. Well, of course it's supposed to, but it hadn't happened in a hundred years. They had just blown it off. And Josiah, because he's read, the, he's, he's read this scroll, had this scroll read to him, reinstitutes the Passover, and the scripture says, as no king since Samuel had done. So all the kings from, not even David did that. Not Solomon. Nobody did this. Josiah reinstitutes re the Passover. Now, remember what Huldah told Josiah, you're going to die in peace. Sadly, that kind of makes him think he's bulletproof, even before bullets were invented. And what's going on is Pharaoh, who's coming from Egypt, and is at war with Babylon, which is over where Iraq is. And so Pharaoh, in order to get at the Babylonians, decides he wants to fight. Well, what's in the middle between Egypt and Iraq? Israel. Judah, right. And Pharaoh is not marching through the middle of Judah. He's marching along the Mediterranean coast. He's marching along the edge of Judah. And Josiah's like, huh, 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 you can't do that. And Josiah goes out with his army and Pharaoh says, look, I don't have any quarrel with you. I'm going over there. Leave me alone. 
you don't have a dog in this fight. And Josiah is like, huh, huh, I'm going to die in peace. I can do anything I want to. Well, he attacks Pharaoh and Pharaoh's army wipe him out and kill Josiah. Let's choose our battles wisely. You know, that, let's make sure before we jump into a fight that we actually have a dog in that fight. And before we jump into a fight, let's make sure the fight is worth fighting. And is this the hill that we want to die on? Well, Josiah doesn't. Uh, and after Josiah, Judah goes downhill fast. So that prophecy that Huldah said, that not going to happen to you. It didn't happen in Josiah's time. Now, what about uh, you're going to die in peace? Well, had Josiah been reasonable, he would have lived a whole lot longer and died in peace. But Josiah took that into his own hands and suffered because of it. Uh, Josiah, and we're going to find out all the rest of the kings are his sons. There's a bunch of brothers that end up being kings because once Pharaoh beats Josiah, uh, Josiah's son becomes king. Pharaoh says, ah, I don't think so, and knocks, pulls him out, sticks in somebody else's king, changes his name, and then the same thing happens when the Babylonians come and they wipe them out and they change kings and change their names and stuff too. But after Josiah, things go south for Judah, which we'll get to over the next several weeks, but not next week because we got the Pentecost picnic. Okay, questions, observations about any of this? I think you're talking about Josiah doing the facts of it for the first time and maybe a hundred years. There's the people really needs to know their history. A lot of people that weren't interested in doing that, but it makes a difference. And the point of these religious festivals is not just to have a big meal. The point is to remind the people that God brought you out of Egypt, brought you out of slavery in Egypt, and the whole liturgy that goes around with the Passover and that whole whole week-long celebration that is the Passover is to remind people how good God is and how He promises to take care of you right. and how He has brought you out of slavery. And he, you know what God has done in the past, He can do it again. Yeah. Which is why we do the liturgical stuff that we do. That's why we have whole, uh, Lent and Holy Week every year. You know, it's not not because I get paid by the hour. It's not because, well, you know, we want to keep you out of trouble for that week. It's to remind us of how good God is and what He's done for us. In our case, we can remember that you know, this Francis got pizza for a heaven rescue line. It was true when he wrote this Star Spangled Banner. It's been true throughout history. God has taken good care of this country, and we uh, we need to pray for it that. We can take good care of well, it too. Founded on godly principles, and we need to remember that. It was. Yes. We got sadness when I talked to the leader of the Eric Major. Told me that we could help him celebrate the 4th of July. But when they turned it over to the little children, and nobody, no adult, was uptown. We went over to Claremont one, uh, yeah, one Fourth of July, and they were having a big brew pom pom. They thought about, now we aren't going to call up the Knights of Columbus. <laughs> we're going to call up Tom's trumpeters, or. I mean, we sit here, we live here, we're free, we come to church, we pray, uh, we can go home and, I don't know, love my, my kids have paws. I have a dog and two cats, <laughs> and they get fed before I came up here this morning. But it just breaks my heart. When I was growing up, I was an Air Force brat, so I guess maybe I had a little bias. <laughs> but people liked us. They liked us in the little country school, and we made friends, and we fit in. Everybody liked everybody. And then I come down here, and not until... Helen got me a lovely gift 
on Friday. It was a picture of a church in this town that I came to as a new bride, and the whole former family filled a pew. And that's why we went to that church, because we didn't get to go to get corrupted by that. And so it's better. But Helen, someone had, had made a, some, it was a piece of art. And I'm sending it to my daughter. But when I looked at that, it was like God saying, I want you to remember. I want you to remember. I want you to think about what I've done. And a week ago, Saturday, I fell down. After coming out of God's spell, I went down to the new place, the New York uh, Peace and Bagel. It's wonderful. Best cannoli I've <laughs> ever eaten in my life. Anyway, then the boys picked me up, went out to restore it, Habitat, because I need a little table to sit my TV on. It's been sitting on the filing cabinet all these years, and every time the carpet band comes, it has to clean up the rust from the filing cabinet. So I got the filing cabinet out. And but before I even got in restore, I don't go out very much. And I thought when you always put the car up at the those little dividers that service curves out in the parking lot. I thought, okay. So I just took off and pretty soon, flat on my face, all those white pants I had on this morning, all black all over, I reached in the job. My knees were scuffed, my elbow was scuffed, my hands were scuffed, and I've been using, it's a lidocaine gel, and it has worked very well. It, it's not an antibiotic. My body's been healing itself because God makes us in a wonderful and marvelous way. But when I fell right here, God wanted me to know the agony. His son fell for three long hours. Because I've never had anything so bad mm. as whatever it was wow. it poked the hole here mm. and, and that's why on, on sunday every sunday we do this in remembrance of him you're right to remember if we don't remember our history then we're lost we're doomed to replace it well we're going to pray for sound government O oh Lord, our governor, bless the leaders of our land that we may be a people at peace among ourselves and a blessing to other nations of the earth. To the president and members of the cabinet, to governors of states, mayors of cities, and to all in administrative authority, grant wisdom and grace in the exercise of their duties. To senators and representatives and those who make our laws in states, cities, and towns, give courage, wisdom, and foresight to provide for the needs of all our people and to fulfill our obligations in the community of nations. To the judges and officers of our courts, give understanding and integrity that human rights may be safeguarded and justice served. And finally, teach our people to rely on your strength and to accept their responsibilities to their fellow citizens that they may elect trustworthy leaders and make wise decisions for the well-being of our society that we may serve you faithfully in our generation and honor your holy name. For yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Amen.